Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light and the darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory, and you love your whole creation and we your creatures glorify you father son and holy spirit amen incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds you may sing your praise with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. The psalm for this evening is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? When evildoers came upon me to eat up my flesh, it was they, my foes and my adversaries, who stumbled and fell. 
Though an army should encamp against me, yet my heart shall not be afraid. And though war should rise up against me, yet will I put my trust in him. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the fair beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he shall keep me safe in his shelter. He shall hide me in the secrecy of his dwelling and set me high upon a rock. Even now he lifts up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer in his dwelling an oblation with sounds of great gladness. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. You speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face from me, nor turn away your servant in displeasure. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will sustain me. Show me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Deliver me not into the hand of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and also those who speak malice. What if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? O tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Be strong, and he shall comfort your heart. Wait patiently for the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Father, protector of those who hope in you, you heard the cry of your son and kept him safe in your shelter in the day of evil. Grant that your servants who seek your face in times of trouble may see your goodness in the land of the living. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Leviticus. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemies the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemies the name shall be put to death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Acts. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have heard, seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The third reading is from the book of Matthew. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At least two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, 
He has uttered blasphemy. Why further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. of the church and for all the people let us pray to the Lord Lord have mercy for our public servants for the government and those who protect us that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed let us pray to the Lord Lord have mercy for those who work to bring peace justice health and protection in this and every place let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. To you, O Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In 1996, the Summer Olympic Games were underway in Atlanta, and people from all over the world had converged in Atlanta to participate and watch some of the finest athletes in the world competing in the 26 sports. 18 days into the Games, Eric Rudolph detonated pipe bombs at Centennial Olympic Park. The blast killed one person and injured 111 others. It was the first of four bombings committed by Rudolph in 1996 and early 1997. Rudolph eluded capture for years, but was finally arrested in North Carolina in 2003. Two years later, he pleaded, uh, he pleaded guilty to all four bombings. But before anyone knew the name Eric Robert Rudolph, the FBI, FBI identified uh, an Atlanta security guard named Richard Jewell as a person of interest, uh, largely because he was something of a loner and kind of sort of fit a profile of a lone bomber. The media had a field day with it, portraying Jewell as a failed law enforcement officer who may have pl uh, planted the bomb so that he could find it and be hailed as a hero. It was all false witness. Once the dust settled, it was clear that Jewel was, in fact, a hero. He had spot us, spotted the suspicious backpack, alerted the appropriate authorities, and helped to clear the area of spectators in the 13 or so minutes before the bomb exploded. Without a doubt, the number of casualties was reduced because of Jewel's actions. But unfortunately, the damage had already be done, had been done to Jewel's reputation. His name had been forever connected to the Centennial Park bombing, and if you ask people two or three years afterwards who the bomber was, inevitably they would mention his name, even though he had been exonerated. In 2019, a biographical movie about Richard Jewell, directed by Clint Eastwood, was released. It may help to recover some of Jewell's reputation, but sadly, Jewell died in 2007, so he will never see the benefits of it. The Eighth Commandment is simple. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, I would guess if you thought about that commandment, most of you, if you thought back to your own time in confirmation, think that this commandment is mainly about gossip, that our false witness most often has to do with the ways we talk about one another to third parties, to another person. And that's certainly true, but we cannot overlook the fact that this commandment, in its simplest meaning, has to do with what is said in public courts of justice. And this is exactly what we see in today's gospel reading. 
You'll recall that we are working through a sermon series this Lent focused on Jesus' passion and God's call for us to repent and to return to him. Return to the Lord your God. We are looking at several of the events that occurred along the way as Jesus went to the cross for our salvation. We are examining the sins committed. The idea is that these events can help us to recognize our own sinfulness and help us to hear God's call to return to him as a loving word spoken to us as a child of God. He invites us to trust in him for our salvation, one for us on the cross. Our gospel takes us to a dark place, though. Jesus has been betrayed by Judas Iscariot. The temple guards have seized him and hauled him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and all of the scribes and elders had gathered. They have decided that they are going to put Jesus to death, presumably in order to protect their own power and position. And they are determined to complete this task by any means necessary. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. It's worth stopping right there to simply ponder that sentence for a minute. They were actively looking for someone to offer lies under oath with the intention of putting Jesus to death. How evil do you have to be that you're willing to seek false testimony in order to kill someone? But it gets worse. Matthew says they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. How evil do you have to be that you're willing to offer false testimony, knowing full and well that it is intended to lead to another person's death? All that aside, these actions clearly conflict with the Eighth Commandment and its most obvious meaning. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. It's first and foremost about testifying falsely in court against another person. And so we observe the sin that comes out in the trial, but we do not really feel it, not in a personal way, because most of us have never been put in the position where we have to testify in court against someone else, falsely or otherwise. But Luther, as he does so well, stretches our understanding of the commandment, and in doing so brings the weight of the law down to us. The commandment, he says, forbids all sins of the tongue by which we may injure or offend our neighbors. He says in the large catechism, it is a common malicious plague that everyone would rather hear evil than good about their neighbors. Even though we ourselves are evil, we cannot tolerate it when anyone speaks evil of us. Instead, we want to hear the whole world uh, say good thing, golden things of us. Yet we cannot bear it when someone says the best things about others. Our false testimony often consists of the rumors and innuendos that we utter about other people. The whispered, hey, did you hear? And the murmured, you're not going to believe this, slip off our tongues. The half-truths and outright lies we speak about brothers and sisters without ever speaking directly to them. The slander and backbiting we too often delight in sharing. Luther boils it down like this. No one shall use the tongue to harm a neighbor, whether friend or foe. No one shall say anything evil of a neighbor, whether true or false, unless it is done with proper authority or for that person's improvement. And when we are looking to help someone out, we do it one-on-one -on -one directly with the person in a spirit of love and concern like a brother or sister would do for one another. Now, we've all broken this commandment. You have broken this commandment. I have broken this commandment. And we are all deserving of punishment for that sin. Each of us has and each of us is. If we look around today, there is so much false witness against our neighbors, it's not even funny. Go on social media and, and what was once created for reuniting family and friends from across the country and world has now become a place to bash one another. Cyberbullying runs rampant, and I have personally witnessed how it split a church in two. Children, young adults, and anyone else on social media can witness this happening in posts, pictures, and videos that tear people down or give unrealistic expectations. The hatred and false witness across social media has caused many parents uh, to put their foot down and refuse to give their children a phone that has access to internet in hopes to shield them from it. 
Our world loves to tear each other down. But God calls us to a different path. He invites us to return to him. We are called to turn and leave behind our sins of false witness and see that he has something different in mind. We are called to repent, to make a 180 degree turn. God calls us not to tear one another down, but to build each other up, to help support one another in times of need. God uses us to help others when they are in need. We need to be countercultural. We do not need to spread hatred and disgust with others on social media and especially not in person. We need to tell others how we see them. We see each person as a child of God, one whom God created and made special, one whom God sent his son to the cross to die in order to redeem them and save them. Church should not be a place where people are afraid to come to because of what other people may say or think about them. Church is a place where we can come and be at home to be refreshed and to be renewed. And so this evening, God is calling us to first know that Christ endured all of that false witness in Jerusalem in order to reconcile us to God and win forgiveness for all of our false witness. And second, to empower us to speak the best about others, to help protect their reputation, and to always put the best construction on everything. Much like Paul, after his road to Damascus conversation, when he was empowered to turn from his own false witness about Christ, in order to speak the very best about our Lord and Savior. We too, or we can too, and we get to, all because of what Christ has done for us. Return to the Lord your God. Receive his love and forgiveness. We are to turn aside from our sins and serve the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul, for he will never forsake you ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through peril unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.